All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, August 2012, the U.S. mission in Benghazi, Libya, convenes an emergency meeting. A day earlier, a secret cable had been sent explaining that the consulate could not defend against a, quote, coordinated attack. Less than a month later, on September 11th, 2012, there was an attack on the consulate in Benghazi, damaging the compound and leading to four deaths. Ambassador Chris Stevens, an information officer, Sean Smith, and two CIA operatives, Glenn Doherty and Tyron Woods, both of whom were former Navy SEALs. Um, we are reaching the 10th anniversary of the Benghazi attacks and... To my mind, despite all the chatter about the Benghazi attack and the deep politicization of it that took place in the years after, in many ways, the lasting hallmark of the incident is that no one really knows exactly what it was. Uh, The waters have been so, so muddied. But I will say, if there's anyone who might have an answer to the question of what exactly was Benghazi, it is Leon Nafok, who created the show Slow Burn. He's the host of the Fantastic Fiasco series, and Fiasco did a whole season on the Benghazi attack and the political fallout. He joins us now back on the show, 10th anniversary of Benghazi. Uh, Leon, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. And as always uh, with us, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Um, So, Leon, the attack was it was so politicized, as people know, there were so many hearings. Fox News talked about it endlessly for years. Trump picked it up in his campaign against Hillary Clinton. Um, You kind of point out in your series that very few people maybe stopped to actually focus on what the actual incident itself was and try to understand what it really was. Um, Do you feel like you got close (laughs) to an answer? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and I think um, what what we found as we embarked upon uh, you know the sort of the production of this season was that you have to really rewind the clock pretty significantly to explain like how we got to this point where the U.S. diplomatic compound in Benghazi was attacked. Um, in order to explain sort of how all the moving parts came together and converged, you honestly have to go back to the Gaddafi regime in Libya. Um, and I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> but, <laughs> Six hours later. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But but I but I will just say that it kind of like stunned me to realize like how impossible it was to explain this pretty discreet event without kind of offering listeners this like long sweep of history. Hmm. Um, and um and, and and I think we needed we needed to do that in the show because if you don't if you don't do that it's hard to explain like why the ambassador who died Chris Stevens was in Benghazi at all um, for someone like me who knew the word Benghazi but didn't even really think of it as a place I would I will confess like I knew it was a place but I just I had no sense of it at all um, the word Benghazi like just was completely synonymous with the scandal in my mind going into this research um, and so it was like very uh, it was kind of um. A, a very satisfying process to to just like peel back the cause and effect and trace it all, all the way back to the beginning of the of the Gadd- Gaddafi dictatorship. I also think that's really important, Leon, because 
This was an event that had some pretty distinct historical echoes. And those echoes, I think, confused people about what the story actually was. So you have this memo that we're talking about today that comes a month early, and Republicans start to talk about that as the bin Laden determined to strike memo for Benghazi. Um, you yeah, have a smoking gun. Like- yeah, and attacks on embassies um, that had happened in the past. And so people kind of brought their understanding of those events to Benghazi, and that kept them from maybe seeing some of the specifics of what happened there. I would also add that people you know, involved in all the investigations in Congress looked to past uh, investigations as a roadmap mm-hmm. for how to mm-hmm. how to conjure, you know, a sense of scandal and how to, um, you know, prosecute the case in public. Uh, it was, you know, the, the Benghazi hearings were, I think, very deliberately inspired by, you know, the Watergate hearings, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I think about the Benghazi hearings, I mean, it's like a master class in PR and how you Absolutely. keep a story going over and over and over again. I mean, the only thing I think we can compare it to today is like CRT and the way that CRT became the new buzzword. But before that, Benghazi was like, it was impossible to not hear it on any single channel, especially Fox News. But it was like you could not get away from that was always like the the smoking gun sort of sense. But, you know, to be fair, if you ask somebody on the street, what is this about? (laughs) Most people would say. I have no idea, and I don't even know where Libya is, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's it's funny. I mean, I covered the 2016 election, you know, day to day, and 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 for much of that election, in the back of my mind, I would muse about, well, if I got to ask Donald Trump one question, what would it be? And I think my question would have just been, can you tell me what happened in Benghazi? And he absolutely would not have had an answer to that, um, you know. And I think that sort of indicates where we were. And I mean, I to some extent, to take Kelly's point and make it even more cynical, you know, how much was was it a deliberate effort to not really ever get to the bottom of it, as far as you could tell, Leon? Yeah, well, I'll just, one quick thing I'll say is that you brought up Trump. And one thing I didn't quite appreciate initially was that uh, the Trump's election, insofar as it was, you know, helped by the email scandal around Hillary Clinton, uh, he owes that to, to the Benghazi yeah. scandal. Like the, the Benghazi scandal is what led to the revelation about Hillary Clinton's emails. And so I, I felt quite vindicated sort of in our interest in Benghazi when I realized it's how consequential it was, uh, because I think it somewhat consensus view now that like this was a pure distraction and a completely insignificant, you know, blip and, it it just it it kind of just startling to realize that that what seems like an insignificant blip had this like domino effect that you know plausibly uh, <laughs> helped elect Trump. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I think a lot of people didn't really care what happened. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, saw its power as a political weapon, right? And and that was their that was the extent of their interest in it. Uh, what's really what was really interesting to me, and and again, I won't get into like the Gaddafi of it all, but like Ambassador Stevens, who was one of four four people who was killed that night, um, he was sort of trotted out by Republicans as a as a martyr is the wrong word, but like he was point he was he was a victim. He was he was this he was this person who um, whom the whom the U.S. government failed, you know, whom, whom the U.S. government failed to protect. He was this uh, casualty of Hillary Clinton's and Barack Obama's fecklessness uh, in the Middle East. Um, and, and a lot of the, that critique kind of like positions Clinton and Obama as um, naive, like they didn't understand the threat. They didn't, they never, these Democrats never understood terrorism. They never, they never wanted to call anything terrorism. They were, you know, they were too politically correct to do, to be adequately worried about the threat of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, and the great irony that we discovered was that Chris Stevens, the ambassador, was the most open-minded, I would say, to like even some would say, ex, you know, ex, extremist thought. Like he he wasn't he wasn't sympathetic to Islamic extremists or anything like that. But he was, I think, a big Kind of cornerstone of his life as a diplomat was listening to everybody, meeting with everybody. Oh, this person is supposed to be radioactive and and, and, a, and, a, and a radical, you know, extremist. Like, don't talk to him. 
Chris Stevens would have wa- would have wanted to. He thought that it was important to engage with those people. And the reason he was in Benghazi was because e- even though he knew it was dangerous, was that he n- knew that being on the ground in a place like that mm-hmm. is the only way to sort of uh, be an effective diplomat in a country that, that that is, you know, wrestling with a bunch of different factions. And so you asked, like, did people actually want to know what happened here? I, I think... Some people certainly did, but I think there was a real indifference. There was a real indifference to like Chris Stevens' ideas, beliefs, like in holding him up as this as this victim. I think people really uh, did a disservice to his to his yeah. entire career. I'm so glad that you raised that back up, though, because that is what gets lost whenever something like this becomes scandalized, right? Everybody becomes a moving piece to make a political point and not necessarily the real people that they were. And Benghazi, it seems to me, is especially prone to that because it wasn't just that it was a useful political tool for the right, but also it becomes memefied very quickly. I mean, the reason we all, not the only reason, but one reason we all know the name Benghazi is it becomes this like weird acrostic on um, on Twitter and still persists in some corners of Twitter to this day. Yeah. I mean, that acrostic was like probably one of five things I knew about Benghazi going into this <laughs> season. Like, uh, I, I, I recognize, you know, I rec- sort of thought of it as um, as an early instance of the kind of conspiracy mongering that um, obviously has exploded in the years since. Like each little letter stood for a different component of the conspiracy and it, it had the ominousness, you know, uh, sort of a vague ominousness about it that that people could project onto. Um, looks to me like a Rosetta Stone for sort of how people's delusions uh, are expressed today. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And and the delusion and conspiracy is it becomes the heart of it, right? It becomes the project um, in a way. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think the other thing to, to mention too, maybe, is that like a lot of this was about preventing Hillary Clinton from getting elected. Like everyone, everyone understood that Clinton, who was Secretary of State when the Benghazi attack occurred, everyone understood that she was going to be running for president, and this was just like a really, really effective way to undermine her. And obviously, each successive investigation was a way to keep it in the news. Um, so I think beyond sc- scoring, you know, points on TV, there, there was like a real goal here, I think. Yeah. The the issue that's so wild to me is that while it became clear that, yes, certain mistakes were made or, yes, you know, um, some people that may have um, acted slowly or either improperly, it was the way that this investigation went on and on and on seemingly without an end and... I started reading some of like how the inquiry was played out and it just it's mind boggling to me to realize that this investigation lasted longer than the Kennedy assassination, than Pearl Harbor, than the September 11th attacks, that they had um, 800 pages of, you know, filing 75,000 documents, interviews with hundreds of witnesses. And Pompeo was like, actually, we need more. <laughs> and it's like, what else do you need? I mean, it's it's kind of startling when you realize all of these resources could have put been put to something some something so much more productive. Yeah, I mean it was like elect- okay. it was an electoral strategy, I would yeah. say. You know, you that's see, what all all that was about. <laughs> did you see recently I think just this last week, Sarah Palin, who's running for uh representative for the house i guess uh they asked her what are you going to be your priorities when you get into that and she goes well you know she's listening a few things but one of them was you know we, i think we need to look into benghazi you know i think we really need to get to the bottom of that <laughs> are you serious oh i missed that <laughs> trot out the hits wow. you know uh, i did not i did not see that that's amazing yeah yeah um so so look We've been focusing a lot on the aftermath and the politicization and the hearings and, you know, yeah, yeah. To, to honor your original point and where we started, <laughs> which is like really this story. No, because it's like it's a really smart, actually, like journalistic and responsible journalistic trick, which is to say, like, everyone thinks the story starts here at the incident and then starts from there. And actually, the story starts here. It's like very simple to just be like, actually, if you just start your clock a few years earlier, you'd probably find the real story. So let's let's yeah. do a little bit of that, because um and and moreover, come back to this, this memo on the sixteenth because there is this air of like, oh, there were warnings, there were warnings, and no, and and then Hillary Clinton was asleep at the wheel or whatever. And this memo does seem to indicate that at least in some way, 
they viewed this compound as vulnerable. And as you said, Christopher Stevens still went into a, a scenario that he knew was potentially compromised. So what do you make of that memo and then also how it got reported, especially in that window between the 16th and September 11th itself? Yep. All right. Well, let me give you like a thumbnail yeah. sort of sum- summary of the of the cause and effect that that, that we kind of uh, identified. So, without going back into the beginnings of the Gaddafi regime, which we do on the show, <laughs> uh, you know, I think the story can start with the Libyan revolution uh, in 2011 as part of the Arab Spring. Um, you know, that revolution really originates in Benghazi. Gaddafi was you know based in in Tripoli. Benghazi was always sort of seen as a a, a, a place where there were people who were against him. Um, one person t- told us that, uh, you know, if, if if Tripoli, the capital of Libya, is Washington, D.C., then, you know, Benghazi might, might be understood as like L.A. or New York. It's like a, 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 it's an intellectual center. It's a it's a cultural center. Um, and so after the revolution began, Libya was sort of divided in two with Gaddafi kind of retaining his grip on the West in Tripoli and Benghazi becoming a base for the rebels. Um Chris Stevens was sent to Benghazi after the United States and the coalition of European countries decided to intervene in the Libyan revolution. Gaddafi was about to destroy Benghazi. It was understood that he had a convoy heading towards the city, and it was it was decided that it was a humanitarian crisis in the making. So airstrikes were ordered uh, by Hillary, you know, including by Hillary Clinton. Um, and uh, after after Gaddafi was sort of stalled. Chris Stevens was sent to Benghazi to essentially um, be a liaison to the rebels who were trying to overthrow Gaddafi. Um, the administration's sort of big fear as the revolution was was unfolding and as Gaddafi was sort of on his heels was like, who's going to replace him? You know, who are these rebels? Are they are they our friends? Are they, you know, quote unquote, good guys? Or, or who are they? Like, what are we unleashing here? And so I think Stevens' objective in going to Benghazi in, the, you know, in 2011, so this is significantly earlier than when the attack occurred, um, his goal was to sort of figure out who they were. You know, was, that was when the, when the diplomatic compound in Benghazi came into existence. Uh, it was the summer of, of 2011. Um, Gaddafi was killed that following fall. Um, there's an incredible clip of Hillary Clinton reacting to it. I don't know if you guys remember it, but she, she, she says kind of in a gloating tone, we came, we saw, he died. Right. Um, anyway, so a, as predicted, sort of Gaddafi's death created this power vacuum. And, and the big question was like, who was going to take over? Um, and like, Crudely speaking, this, there seemed to be two two possibilities. One was that Lib- Libya would sort of embrace liberal democracy, and the other uh, possibility seemed to be that it would become like a theocracy led by you know fundamentalist political Islamists, and that was what America did not want. Um, Stevens, as I said before, was sort of open minded to both sides. He like wanted to, to he wanted to to not alienate the purported extremists, just as he wanted to foster liberal democracy, uh, just like Obama and Clinton did. Um, But by the time we get to the fall of 2012, you know, a year removed from Gaddafi's death, um, it's really unclear sort of who is succeeding at gaining control over the country, over Libya. And for like a year and a half, there was this like, scramble of different militias that had, you know, formed during the revolution to get rid of Gaddafi. Now they were, you know, without a common enemy, suddenly they were turning on each other. Um, some of these militias were friendly to the United States. Others were really hostile to the United States. Um, and so that's where you sort of get the situation in the summer and early fall of 2012, like right in the months before the attack, where people are starting to be scared that Benghazi, you know, is an unsafe place, that there are these militias that have taken over the hospitals and the airports and the oil fields. Um, You know, there were other attacks in Benghazi prior to the one that we're talking about. There was, um, you know, a bomb was was like an improvised bomb was was placed outside the diplomatic compound, a wall, you know, a a hole was blown through the wall. There was um, a convoy being driven by a UN, UN official that was attacked. Um, with RPGs, I believe. There was a Red Cross building that was attacked. Um, You know, there was a huge, huge demonstration um, by extremists, by, you know, people with black flags, you know, who wanted Sharia law. They they, they sort of put out a big show of force in Benghazi. So all of these different data points formed, you know, a picture of a place in some peril. Um, And so this memo that we're talking about that came out of the uh, mission in, in Benghazi on 
August 16th, uh, you know, summarized that situation. It said it said that there are these extremist groups here. There are terrorist groups here. There are people who don't want us here. And we don't know that uh, we could that this compound which is, by the way, not an official embassy and therefore didn't have all the normal protections of an embassy. We don't know if this building can sustain a uh, coordinated attack, um, which is, you know, very ominous to read when you know yeah. that a month later, yeah. it, it, the exact same thing, exact, that exact thing happened. Wow. Well, I just want to say that's the answer I would have expected Donald Trump to give me. Had <laughs> <laughs> it also makes it clear why... You know, it, it makes it clear that some that the memo wasn't necessarily like prognosticating. It was just saying this has become a degraded security situation and we just don't have the resources to make it safe. I'm also very struck by the way that even though there is something very specific to the Arab Spring and Libya and Benghazi to that story, it, it does sound like just about every U.S. attempt to try... It does sound like just about every U.S. attempt to try to have a heavy hand in structuring the governments in the Middle East and around the world. Yeah, except this was Obama doing it, you know, and yep. he thought like they, the Obama administration thought they could do it better. Um, and I think that's they why sure it did. becomes such a, such a potent symbol for the for the right, because here's an example of what happens when you let the Democrats do this thing that, you know, needs to be done with for, force and guns and, and bombs. You know, the Obama administration, obviously, they did. Uh, send airstrikes to get rid of Gaddafi, but they wanted to 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 rebuild the country or help rebuild the country through other means, and um, the the failure of that mission sort of becomes like this very mm-hmm. powerful weapon weapon against them ideologically. Yeah, and and that memo, um, it does get some coverage, and I think when we were planning sort of well, how do we want to talk about the Benghazi anniversary, you suggested this moment. I mean, I think you pointed out that this was actually a moment in which Fox News kind of really did see this for what it was and this did do some real reporting here around this memo obviously they then went into kind of full politicization of this in the aftermath but can you talk a little bit about the coverage and fox's role early on at least yeah i mean this this memo was i, be- I believe and i'm 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 not 100 percent on this but i i'm i'm, I'm close i'm close to 100 percent uh this memo was unearthed because pamela k brown a reporter at fox news foia for it um and uh, it, it is an important document. Like, there's no question that this document raises questions about, well, if a diagnosis had been made and if that diagnosis had been passed along to Washington, why wasn't anything done? Mm. And, you know, th- there are totally fair critiques, I think, of the State Department for uh, for its kind of failure to, like, act on the red alert, right? Like, I don't think I'm, I'm not saying it's Hillary Clinton's fault. I think, you know, I think a lot of people wanted it to be Hillary Clinton's fault. And I think she was able to truthfully say that, yes, this memo, this cable was one of thousands that came into the State Department, you know, uh, and I don't read every cable and 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 a decision, you know, was made below me, you know, to not act on this. Um, I think it's also worth saying that if you actually read the, the memo carefully, like it's it's promising requests for additional security. It's saying that we r- requests will, are forthcoming, and it seems like that didn't necessarily happen. There were requests for. Sorry, this gets really confusing, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I, I probably shouldn't go down this this rabbit <laughs> hole. But there there were there were requests for security, and uh, it's really hard to sort of pin the blame on any one. Uh, person, certainly the person at the top, uh, except insofar as like everything that happens under her is her fault. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a real, it's a real piece of reporting. And, but the problem is that it, it, when you look at everything else that was, you know, said about what really happened in Benghazi or why, why Benghazi really happened, so much of everything else was trumped up. It was, it was, it was, mm. you know, inflated, was inflated or distorted. I think, you know, at a certain point, people were, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, Obama, Obama knew this was going to happen. He he knew this was going to happen. He chose not to prevent it, which is like obviously absurd. At worst, what you can say about this is that it was like a negligent failure to act on intelligence and um, a failure to take these threats seriously. Um, but again, I do want to say that, that Stevens, Chris Stevens himself, like he went to Benghazi. He was based in Tripoli at this point. He was the yeah. he was the ambassador based in the capital. He chose to go to Benghazi for this trip when this attack occurred and and he made that decision, you know, knowing full well what's in this memo that he approved, knowing full well how fluid, let's say, the the political situation in Benghazi was. And he did it because he knew that Benghazi was sort of core to Libya's future. He knew that like 
if you don't have Benghazi, if you don't have a year in Benghazi, if you don't have friends in Benghazi, then if you're America, like you can't expect to have any real influence over the country's future. And so he made that calculation and he was um, he do, he did it with his eyes open, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I will say that so that's some of the most affecting stuff in the series is the sort of profile of Chris Stevens and, and his and his long dedication to diplomacy. And also, I will say, you know, in the way that you have pointed out that the story around the roots of this and the aftermath of this have been muddied um, and context has been lost. The night of itself has been completely distorted and you do a great job in the series of just pointing out what happened that night and how it was a confluence as we've been discussing of mistakes and miscalculations, but also unfortunate circumstance and Mm -hmm. happenstance and all those things that, you know, is kind of how life works. It's a confluence of all those things, but there's um, some great reporting on the night itself as well. Thanks. Yeah, we were we were we were very proud to to be able to to sort of render that night through the through the eyes and memories of people who were like there. And like we talked to the guy whose job it was that night to try to protect Chris Stevens and and, and he wasn't able to. And and it was really an unforgettable interview. Um, It's yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite part of the series, honestly, like the political stuff obviously is important, but like being able to just like see in your mind's eye like what occurred that night there's like a stark kind of contrast to the haze that that characterizes the rest of it you know yeah Yeah. well and that's you know that's exactly the kind of work the work that you do in uh, all your work and all your series so thank you um for joining us thanks for doing it and and that was the the current season of fiasco is uh about the aids crisis and is also incredible uh but then was that the previous season to that that's right yeah Yeah, this is benghazi was our fourth season yeah aids aids the aids crisis is our fifth that's the that's the most recent one um and people can find it people can find it on apple podcasts if you go to the luminary channel uh or if you have the luminary app you can find it there but probably the easiest way for most people is to go on apple podcasts find the luminary channel and subscribe and uh fiasco benghazi will be right there all right there we go all right leon Nafak, thank you so much uh for doing that. thank you guys so much sorry if i if i if i rambled uh, <laughs> never apologize okay. for reporting in context. yes it's complicated <laughs> <laughs> uh, nicole hammer thanks to you thank you jody and kelly carter jackson thanks to you my pleasure Radio Tokyo.